Uh, good morning. Um, um, I'm Venkat Guruswamy. I'm a senior scientist here at the Simons uh, Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all um, to this week's workshop. As you know, um, the Simons Institute is a leading uh, international venue for collaborative research in TCS. Um, it was established in 2012, uh, with a generous grant from the Simons Foundation, and the Institute brings together the world's uh, leading researchers in theory of computing and related fields, as well as the next generation of outstanding young scholars in terms of postdocs and fellows. So each semester we have two programs that attract several long-term visitors, junior and senior to uh, the Berkeley campus, and which include multiple workshops that also convene more short-term visitors. And these days we also have regular summer activities, in including full programs like uh, the one on analysis and TCS this summer. I know the weather may not uh, be like it, but it is actually summer, so it's a summer program. So one of the uh, inaugural programs hosted by the Institute, if for those who might recall, was in fall 2013 and was on real analysis in, in computer science. So it's really nice to host this program to wrap up 10 years of uh, exciting activities uh, in the field. And um, okay, so uh, now to this week's program, I'd like to welcome you to the first workshop of the analysis and TCS program called Beyond the Boolean Cube. And first, I would like to thank the organizers for their work in putting together a great program and bringing you all here. Um, so that those are Dor Minzer, Ishan Chattopadhyay. If you're here, raise your hand, get an applause. Uh, you all film us, uh, Tali Kaufman and James Lee. So thank you all. And uh, just a few uh, logistics for the coming week. So food is provided before the first talk uh, and during the breaks. For lunch, you're on your own, but there are many options uh, close by. And uh, we ask that uh, you please leave food and drinks, including coffee, um, outside the auditorium. And if you want to store something when you go for lunch or otherwise, there are lockers on the far side of the building to store your stuff. And um, all our talks, as always, are uh, live streamed and uh, will be posted on the YouTube channel. So our videographer, Omiya, will help uh, with any uh, AV issues, and he's always on deck. And uh, this. I believe this workshop is also hybrid, so there will, the session chairs will be monitoring the Zoom channel and uh, taking questions from that. And uh, finally, a special thanks to the events team, without whom you know, these events cannot happen, Ashley Hassan and Elizabeth Ewan. They manage all the logistics locally here, but also accommodations for out-of-town visitors and all the things. Okay, so let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dor, who will say a few, workshop, few words about the scientific plan for the week. Thank you, Venkat, and thank you all for coming, and those in Zoom also. So uh, today we are going to have the first day of the Beyond the Boolean Cube workshop. So, you know, we all, we all know and love the Boolean Cube. You know, it has a uniform measure. It's all nice. Uh, but sometimes you need to go beyond it. And, you know, recent years have seen some applications of that, both, you know, when you consider completely different domains and both when you consider continuous versions of the cube. And we've seen some of these ideas already in the bootcamp, but uh, this week is going to be most devoted to ideas relating to that. So I hope that you'll find it interesting. And uh, yeah, so without that out of the way, let me introduce our first speaker, Ryan O'Donnell, who will tell us about explicit orthogonal and unitary designs. So take it away. Ryan. Thanks, Tor. Thanks, uh, the organizers, for inviting me. Um, yeah, this is joint work with. Uh, Pedro Paradesh at Princeton, who's right there, and uh, Rocco Servidio at Columbia, who's right over there. Uh, okay, so let G be a group of n by n matrices. I always like to start a talk that way with just a plain math sentence, but let me give you some examples. Uh, these are the examples you should have in mind. Um, so this one is all the permutation matrices, just the permutations of the numbers one through n thought of as permutation matrices, that's Sn. And the next example is actually the example that originally motivated us in this work. It's all the rotation matrices, the rotation matrices in n dimensions, the fancy name of which is SON. And then uh, one for the quantum heads, uh, the unitary group, which is basically like all the rotations in n complex dimensions. Okay, so these uh, are all groups, and you, you, they're realized as n by n matrices. Uh, so you might remember the subheading here was about pseudo random rotation. So we're going to be thinking about um, drawing these in a random or pseudo random way. So let's think about the number of bits of entropy or the, the seed length, if you're into pseudo random generators, needed to sample from the uniform distribution on the group. Okay, so for the permutation matrices, there's n factorial of them. So you need log of n factorial bits, which up to logs is about 
uh, n bits of randomness. Now coming to these next two, you know, Star said we got to go beyond uh, discrete things. These are actually continuous groups, so you know it's bad form to call it the uniform distribution. But there's a natural distribution called the hard distribution, which I'm just going to call the uniform distribution. That talk that's like the uniform distribution on all rotations or all unitary uh, matrices. Uh, okay, so how many bits of entropy do you need to pick a random like rotation matrix? Well, even this question is not quite well posed because like a continuous. I mean, there's a continuum of many. Um, Rotation matrices, well, you know, morally speaking, this is like an n by n box of numbers. It's like n squared numbers, and it should be fine to get it to some, I don't know, precision that's like one over n. So you should think of like this requiring of something like n squared bits of randomness to choose. And same story for the unitary group. Uh, okay, uh, I know we're supposed to go beyond the Boolean cube, but I have to at least mention it once. So everything I say in this talk actually makes sense and is applicable. When the group of n by n matrices is all the matrices whose diagonal entries are plus or minus one. And that's just the Boolean cube. Um, but everything I talk about won't like really shed any new light or get any new results about the Boolean cube. So this will be the last time I mention it in the talk, and then we'll go beyond it. But here also, you still need like n bits of randomness to draw uniformly um, from this group. Okay, so what's our, our goal? Uh, our goal is to come up with a pseudo random distribution on G, hopefully sampleable with like lots of fewer bits of entropy, like way less than n bits of entropy, such that you know the, the pseudo random distribution is still some kind of um, model for the uniform distribution. And the precise sense in which we're gonna like look for it, uh, this is we're gonna hope that somehow the kth moments of uh, a group element or a matrix drawn from the pseudo random distribution is close to what it should be with respect to the uniform distribution. And by case moments, really what I mean is um, every product of K entries from the matrix, because all these group elements are now thought of as like uh, N by N matrices. So maybe in more mathematical detail, mm -hmm. you can actually make this matrix, I mean, given a, a group element X, which is like an N by N matrix, you can make this uh, matrix X to the Kth tensor power, like the Kth Kronecker tensor power of X, which is basically the, the box of numbers that, that um, encodes all products of K entries from X. And on the right here, we're gonna take the expectation of this you know, box of numbers over all, uh, over the uniform distribution on the group. So like encodes like all the expected values of products of K entries from your permutation matrix or rotation matrix or unitary matrix. And we want a pseudo random distribution on the group such that it's like, you know, products of K entries have about the same value up to some epsilon. Um, okay, one tiny comment. If you're working with the, the case of the unitary group uh, where these entries have complex numbers, then you should really look at products of like K over two elements from the matrix times uh, K over two elements that are like complex conjugated. But this is the last time I'll mention this technicality. Any questions about like the, the, the rough plan of what we're trying to do? This is kind of like um, KY, almost KY's uniformity. So if you're familiar with this notion in the context of like binary strings, um, this is what we're going for. So we're, we're trying to, these are sometimes called almost KY's uniform distributions over the group, or sometimes called approximate uh, K designs for the group. Okay, so let's uh, like think about what it means in a concrete case. And the easiest one to think about is maybe the case where it's the permutation matrices. And let me also just for concreteness fix K to be four. Okay, so um, you see, if you have a permutation matrix X and you look at this like fourfold tensor power, um, it'll actually still be a matrix with just zeros and ones in it. And it'll, you know, whereas the base permutation matrix has a one in like the IJ position if the permutation maps, you know, I to J, this will have like a one in the ij or i1, i2, i3, i4 position, or you know, these i's position, these j's position if the permutation maps these four i's to these four j's. Um, and then if you take the expectation of that with respect to, well, any distribution, you get like the, the entries encode the probability under your pseudorandom distribution that you map these four numbers to these four numbers. And these are the things that we want to um, approximately preserve with our pseudorandom distribution. It's um, particularly easy to understand what uh, the right answer is supposed to be in the, the permutation matrix case. So if you think about the, what happens on the uniform distribution, 
um, you know, at least if all these like, you know, eight indices between one and n are distinct, then, you know, the probability that a uniformly random permutation will map these four i's to these four j's is, you know, this number, one over n times one over n minus one, uh, et cetera. And then, you know, when they, there's some overlap, you can figure out what the correct answers are. So, you know, in this context, we want a pseudo random distribution on permutation such that, um, you know, for any four indices, uh, the probability they map to some other four indices is about what it should be. Um, so while we're here, let me discuss a little bit about what we mean by uh, epsilon approximate. Mostly, I want to say, like, uh, don't, don't worry about it too much. Uh, there's going to be a lot of parameters in this talk. But um, you see, these, these numbers that we're trying to match are like, this one is on the order of 1 over n to the fourth. Or you know, for general k, it would be like 1 over n to the k. So if you think about like matching, trying to match this number, you kind of at least feel intuitively, epsilon should probably be smaller than 1 over n to the k, right? Otherwise, like this number is not distinguishable from zero, which seems quite bad. Um, on the other, other hand, uh, you know, if epsilon is like one over n to the 100 k, that seems like it's you know doing a very good job of matching it. Um, these are like n to the k many numbers you're trying to match, and then like you know most or all the applications I know, this is about the epsilon you want to take anyway. And therefore, for like the rest of the talk, I will just fix epsilon to be like one over capital n to the 100 k. So let me tell you what's known about this topic of uh, approximate K designs for um, permutations and rotations and unitaries. Um, okay, so first, one thing you can do if you want this you know, good pseudo random distribution is like the, the cheating inefficient solution where you like at random pick a bunch of uh, matrices from the group and then fix that set of matrices and then say my pseudo random distribution is the uniform distribution over this fixed set. So you can do that and it'll, it'll um, you know, do well, but that's not an efficient construction because like the algorithm would have to like remember this giant table of fixed uh, random uh, matrices it chose. Uh, but at least gives us like the baseline that we should be trying to shoot for with in terms of like how many bits of entropy we want to uh, strive to use when making our designs. And it's easy to show you're definitely gonna need at least like log of one over epsilon many bits of entropy, even for this solution. And in our context, where we fixed epsilon to be like this, that's k times log of capital N. And I say capital N because now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to ask you to memorize that like capital N stands for two to the little n. And um, we are indeed going to be thinking about like, you know, pseudo random distributions over like giant, uh, I guess, group elements, like think of them as exponentially large permutations or, or unitaries or rotation matrices. So this is uh, k times little n. So that's basically uh, like the dream amount of uh, seed length or entropy to shoot for. And let me tell you what's known. So let's start with the um, k-wise uniform, almost k-wise uniform permutations, which have some applications here that I, I listed. So around 2005, um, uh, two different uh, groups, Kaplan, Orrin, uh, Reingold, and uh, uh, Kasabov, you know, gave the, the basically the dream result. They got this result with the entropy being order Kn, so that's good. Um, okay, this is also heavily studied uh, by quantum people in the case of um, unitary matrices. And there I like to, you know, really think of the dimension capital N is two to the little n. You can think of it as like unitaries that operate on n qubits, if you know some quantum terminology. And uh, in this context, these works of uh, Brandau, Harrow, Horodecki, and this is uh, Hafferkamp, Hunter Jones, and more Hafferkamp, um, they got to, close to the, the optimal bound. The event of entropy they used is like polynomial in K and in N. And I should say, like in this context, you know, optimizing the number of bits of entropy is not what they really cared about. It's more like, a, like something you can uh, observe about the result. Um, what they really actually just care about is the following. Let's say you want to make a unitary on n qubits just by like making a, a, a random quantum circuit. You have like n qubits and you start putting down like a bunch of random quantum gates. And you feel like if you put down enough of them, like it should um, be close to like a completely random unitary. And um, one way to, you know, quantify that's close to being a completely random unitary is that like all the k fold moments are about what they ought to be. And um, that's uh, what they you know, were mostly motivated by. And 
Um, so they showed that like a random, if you just pick a completely random circuit with like this many uh, gates, then it's uh, approximate K wise or K design for the unitary group. And this is particularly nice because the construction is then like strongly explicit, like even though it's a two to the n by two to the n dimensional unitary of this, you know, poly little n size representation of it in terms of a circuit. Great question. So, so at least for the permutation case, can you get epsilon is zero? Can you get exact independence? Uh, when k is two and three, you can. Uh, I think there aren't explicit constructions known once k is at least four. Well, you should check this paper by uh, Shahar Lovett and Nogolan um, that address this question. Okay, so uh, what do we do in our paper? Um, so we were really interested in rotation matrices, which is uh, this SO2 to the N group. And actually, I'll tell you why. Um, well, okay, let me first say that like, uh, what do we do in the paper? Uh, we kind of get like the optimal result uh, with KN bits of entropy for the rotation matrices and also for the, the unitary matrices. Um, I should note because it's like a very important to the people that are interested in unitary designs. It's not like we show like you can, you know, get like a almost K design using fewer gates when you make your random quantum circuit. It's still gonna be like the same you know, number of gates, like maybe n squared gates. It's just, we don't make a completely random circuit. We like have like only a pseudo randomly chosen circuit using this many bits of entropy that still has all the right uh, um, kth moments. Um, yeah, so just as an aside, the reason we were, I mean, got started in this whole project is we were interested in this paper by um, Pravesh Kothari also here in Raghu Mecca uh, about pseudo random generators for spherical caps. And they got uh, these almost optimal pseudo random generators um, conditioned on this result. So, like, assuming uh, there is a result like this with the optimal seed length for pseudo random rotations, um, they got these almost optimal PRGs for spherical caps. So, this result is now um, unconditional. Um, okay, any questions? So in the first part, I'll tell you about um, some de-randomization techniques that go into it. So uh, let's just take this part of the, the table. And remember I said that the way the, the construction went for unitary matrices, the previous one is just like making a random quantum circuit, uh, like randomly placed gates. And interestingly enough, you know, like 25 years before, uh, the exact same construction was proposed in the context of the permutation matrices by Gowers, who was actually motivated by cryptography. And this first paper by Gowers was literally like, I will make like a random, you know, classical reversible circuit. So like a random circuit with like N bits where each gate is like a permutation on, let's say three bits. So it's like an eight by eight permutation. And uh, he showed the exact kind of similar result with like poly K and poly N here. If you make a random permutation on the N bit strings in this way, um, it'll be close to, you know, K wise uniform. And the subsequent papers by like Huri et al and Brodsky Huri um, like improved these exponents. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. Is it known that N squared is the best you can do when you just combine random gates? Uh, no, actually at the end I'll mention uh, a fact, which I'll spoil now, which is to say that actually, um, like the number of gates you you need constructed it n cubed. Um, what we actually know about the, the 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 permutation matrix case is actually a bit worse than what we know in the the unitary and orthogonal case. Um, yeah, so I'll mention that again at the end. Um, so uh, the way Kaplan, Orr, and Reingold proved their result with like sort of the optimal entry is just taking this more or less as a black box and applying some de-randomization techniques on top of it. And the de-randomization techniques are like pseudo-random walk generators or like uh, alternatively de-randomized squaring of graphs techniques introduced by like Reingold and Luca and um, Vadon. And this is um, um, Rosenman and Vadon. Um, you kind of have your choice of techniques. We like to use this de-randomized squaring of graphs technique. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that on the upcoming slides, but um, one observation we made in the paper, I don't think it's like a super novel observation, but um, we recorded the fact that this de-randomized squaring of graphs, even though it has the word graph in it, it's not really about graphs. I mean, 
if you think about like a like the random walk matrix for a graph, a regular graph, it's just like the average of permutation matrices, uh, at least if it's like a, a, a Cayley graph or an edge colored graph. And we just observed that like the, all this paper about de-randomized squaring of graph also works for like de-randomized squaring of averages of bounded operators. Um, so we'll use that in our, our context where we don't have graphs. This will maybe make hopefully a little bit more sense as I go on. Um, okay. So uh, let's just imagine like, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how this uh, de-randomization tool goes. So remember our goal, let's say in the K equals four case is to come up with some low entropy distribution pseudo on the group G such that um, uh, these two you know, matrices or boxes of numbers are almost the same when you draw from the, the pseudo random distribution or the uniform distribution. We just make a definition for this expression X tensor X tensor X tensor X, I'll call it R of X. And um, to be a bit fancy, this is a representation of the group G. Uh, which just means that like R of X, Y is the same of R of X times R of Y. That's how multiplication of these tensor products works. Uh, okay, so we can also write this quantity, which is sort of like our target, like box of numbers is the expected value of R of X under the uniform distribution. And I'll also just even call that uniform average sub R. That's a, a matrix. Um, okay, this is a very basic fact about groups that we'll, we'll use. Um, in any group, if you fix some group element x0, and then you draw a uniformly random element x, and then you look at x0 times x, the distribution of that is always still the uniform distribution, you know, independent of what x0 was. It just basically follows because you know, there are inverses in groups. And if it's a non-abelian group, it's also the same if you multiply on the right. And um, by the way, this is basically, I mean, we're, we'll be talking later about rotation matrices and uh, unitary matrices where the uniform distribution is really the hard distribution. And like, this is basically the definition of the hard distribution that it like satisfies this property. Um, if you do any fixed rotation and then do a uniformly random rotation, the combination of them is a uniformly random rotation. Okay, so, um, as a corollary of that, if you think of this uniform average of R as like a matrix, and you multiply it on the left by R of any fixed um, group element x0, you get back this uniform average. That's just because, you know, if here's the definition of the uniform average. If you like stick R x0 on the left of here, x0 is uh, not, doesn't depend on x, you can bring it inside, and then you can use this rule. And then you can use this fact that like x0 times x is distributed as uniform again. And so that's why it's true. Um, OK, and actually, therefore, I mean, this is true for literally every fixed x0, every fixed group element x0. So it's also true like for any distribution over group elements. Therefore, as a corollary, if we have um, the average of r of x under any distribution, that's still a matrix. Kind of the matrix of kth moments uh, under the distribution times this uniform average matrix, then you get back the uniform average matrix. And as a further corollary of that, I mean, one distribution is the uniform distribution itself. So if we just plug that in, we get the uniform average of R squared is the uniform average over R. So uh, this is a matrix. And in particular, that means like this is a, a projection matrix. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, you might think about what this matrix is in the case of like k being one and it being the, the permutation matrices. It's the uniform average of like a permutation matrix, which is like the matrix where every entry is one over capital N. It's like projection on the uniform distribution. That's what it would be in this case. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at, see here, Rx is a full tensor or like a tensor product of full matrices. What does it mean to? What is the product operation? Um, which product operation? Like, um, I say when, I, when you write uh, R of x0 times uh, uniform average of R. Uh, so it's like, thinking of this as like a matrix. So, like, think of x as an n by n matrix. This is like an n to the fourth by n to the fourth matrix. Like, uh, okay, it's so just normal matrix multiplication. So just uh, we'll just remember we'll need these facts like literally on the next slide and then we can predict them. So just remember them if you would. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so this is our, our goal. Kn bit entropy distribution, pseudo random distribution on G, such that the pseudo average, like the average under the pseudo random distribution of the RK representation, where RK is like this kth tensor power of X, is you know close to what it's ought to be. Okay, so here's the plan. We can find like a, a real baby pseudo random distribution. It's not gonna be the final pseudo random distribution, just a really like super weak pathetic baby distribution. Sampleable with very few bits of entropy. And uh, we're, we're gonna, the main work will be to show that um, if you average these like kth moments over the baby distribution, it's like not maximally terrible. It's like a teeny bit close to what it ought to be, the average of the kth moments under the uniform distribution. And here we are, I am gonna explicitly say in what sense it flows. Like this is a matrix, this is a matrix. I want the operator norm of the difference to be a little bit less than one. But you should think of it as like just slightly vaguely close to the correct answer. Okay, so um, imagine for a moment that we have this. And now I'll start talking about like, um, later we'll talk about how to get this. I mean, spoiler, it's like from choosing some like random circuits. Um, but like now I want to tell you using de-randomization techniques how you can improve this and get the full desired pseudo-random distribution. So, okay, this is a matrix and we're imagining its operator norm is at most one minus delta. So if we square this matrix, the operator norm is at most one minus delta squared. And what's going on with this squared matrix here? Let's just expand it out. Um, okay, we got like the baby average squared minus baby average times uniform average minus the other way around plus the square of the uniform average. Um, but if you remember from the previous slide, like any average times uniform average equals uniform average. And that happens on the left and right. And we well, you can use it again here. These three are all the uniform average. And we got like two minuses and one plus. So it turns into a minus. And uh, yeah, so this expression equals the square of baby average minus the uniform average. We can put that back in. And, but now what is this baby average squared matrix? Okay. And baby average squared, like, well, I mean, baby average is like, you just pick X1 from the baby distribution and look at this RK of X1. We're squaring it. So let's multiply it by the same thing with just a different letter. Mm, but then like X1 and X2, you could take them to be independent and um, then put these two together on the inside. And then it's a representation. Um, so what you really get is like the expected value of, you know, the kth moments, RK of X for X drawn from what I'll call the baby squared distribution. And the baby squared distribution is draw once from the baby distribution, draw again from the baby distribution, and then multiply the results together. So that's the baby squared distribution. So this is a distribution that you can sample with two times S bits of entropy. So, you know, you had baby and uh, required S bits of entropy, and it's kind of like a teeny bit close to what you want, one minus delta. And now if you just draw from it twice and multiply them together, um, it's two S bits of entropy and you get like, you know, a little bit better. So you can see the obvious thing to do with this. You can like, I don't know, repeatedly square the distribution or like raise it to like, you know, the teeth power, this distribution. And uh, if you raise it to the power T, you'll need S times T bits of entropy. And, you know, we're trying to get one minus Delta down to epsilon. And so you need to raise it to a power that's like one over delta to get the standard constant, and then log one over epsilon to get the standard epsilon. So you need like this many bits of entropy if you just do a bunch of times from baby and multiply them together. And this is where the derandomization comes in. Like instead of repeated squaring, you should do derandomized squaring. And I'll just say in words like what that means briefly without getting into it. But the effect is like, it has this effect that like, you know, you might recognize if you've done like a little bit of de-randomization, it's like, oh, instead of S times like log one over epsilon over delta, like in the de-randomized squaring, you just need like S plus like log one over epsilon plus log one over delta to get the same effect. And I'll just say in words briefly what de-randomized uh, squaring is. Um, you know, when you square the baby distribution, imagine the baby distribution is like uniform distribution or a fixed set of like baby elements. So the baby distribution is uniform over the fixed set of baby elements. And the squared baby distribution is like pick two times from this fixed set and then multiply them together. The randomized squaring is like take all the elements in the baby distribution and put like an expander graph 
down whose vertices are the baby matrices, and then pick a random edge in the expander graph and multiply the matrices associated to its endpoints. De randomized squaring. And um, if you repeatedly de randomize square, you can get this kind of result. I won't really say any more about this part, and I'll just be like, here's the upshot. Um, upshot is this. Uh, we get the desired strongly explicit uh, k times n bit entropy distribution, provided we can find like a sufficiently good like baby distribution. And what is sufficiently good? Um, it's just enough for this delta to be like bounded by like one over this should clearly say greater than or equal to, <laughs> uh, should be at least one over poly k poly n. And like, you just need to like, not need too many bits for the baby distribution, like let's say at most n. In fact, it's gonna be logarithmic in our baby distribution. So uh, yeah, in some sense, like that's most of what I'm gonna talk about for like de-randomization tools. And like, we'll just think about this as like the new goal. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, based on what was written on the previous slide, can't you have like S is K and N and delta is like one over N to the K? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, I, I tried to like get around that by saying upshot. Yeah, first of all, yeah, it's sufficient for S to be like smaller than N K. In our actual application, it's gonna actually be log N, so it'll be like far from this. You might also like, you're very sharp, like think like, oh, like we could have got like delta, like it would have been okay for delta to be way smaller than this and we'd still be okay. But, um, you don't really want that because like, um, even though like this is the number of like uh, pseudo random uh, or truly random bits you need, the um, number of product, like the number of things you multiply together is like polynomial and one over Delta. So even though you only need this many bits. So if you want your like eventual construction to be kind of like, Efficient, you want polynomial in one over delta to not be like polynomial in n and k, um, which is why this is actually why you want delta to be at least this big. So, yeah, very quick with the parameters there, Jan. Uh, that's good. Okay. Great. So now I'm going to talk about uh, what is the baby distribution for all these like settings of um, permutation matrices and rotation matrices and unitary matrices. And it's actually gonna be pretty much the same in all three cases. I sort of already said what it was, but let's talk about it. Um, right. So, you know, this was our, our goal. And I guess what I wanna say is like, we'll get this like, you know, uh, goal of having like the best uh, entropy. Um, as long as we can get like a pretty good baby distribution. So let me talk about this like a uh, pretty good baby distribution in the context of um, the unitary group. Like actually it's like the biggest of all these groups, like actually the rotations and the permutations are themselves unitary. So we'll start at the, 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 the mother of all these groups. Right. So in this context, what do we need? We need this like cheap baby distribution on n qubit quantum circuits. We're gonna sort of use the fact that like every unitary matrix in two to the n dimensions um, can be sort of expressed with n qubit quantum circuits, such that like the, the kth moments under the baby distribution are like vaguely close in this sense to uh, the kth moments under the truly uniform distribution over a completely random unitary. Um, okay, so how are we gonna, get this. Well, uh, yeah, sorry for like the non quantum fans, but it, funnily enough, like we have to, it's, it's most convenient to like talk about like quantum computation. Uh, somehow it invaded even this problem just about like rotations and stuff that we were working on. Um, so, you know, if you've seen like quantum computation 101, you probably know this fact, which is that, um, you know, basically every unitary matrix in two to the n dimensions can be, you know, computed or like arbitrarily well approximated by, um, you know, multiplying together like a tiny little unitaries in like a, a quantum circuit. So there's like a fixed set of like quantum, you know, gates, which are like little unitaries that operate on one or two or three qubits or like two or four or eight dimensions um, that are universal. 
And uh, here's an example, like Yao Yun Shi proved this uh, particular family of uh, unitaries is like the Toffoli gate and like the C naught gate and the knot gate and the Hadamard gate and the phase gate. Um, these gates are sufficient to like, if you multiply them together enough to get like basically any unitary. You do all your quantum computation with these gates. And just to really clarify what it means, like this is a picture uh, of a quantum circuit. It has like N uh, qubits are depicted as wires. And like each of these like red rounded rectangles is like, uh, like a, a gate. This is supposed to be like a, a three qubit gate or an eight by eight unitary operating on these um, tensor factors or qubits. And, uh, you know, they get all multiplied together. Um, it's very hard to depict like a, a, a gate that's operating on non-contiguous qubits. We got to do it. So like, this is my attempt to draw a gate that like operates on this qubit, this qubit, and this qubit. And similarly, this, this qubit, this qubit, and this qubit. And you also might note that in this picture, like I depicted all the gates as though they have like three qubit inputs. Um, whereas, you know, back in the set, like some had like, this was like a three qubit gate, but these are two and one, but it's okay. Without loss of generality, just imagine these all operate on three qubits. Like if you have like a C naught gate, just like pick another qubit gate and like do the identity on it. So I'll henceforth depict all these um, uh, little gates as being three qubit gates. Um, okay. Right, so we know that you can eventually get like more or less any unitary by like, you know, multiplying together enough gates. We want this cheap baby distribution on n qubit circuits that does like something. And so the, the natural distribution is to literally just pick one gate. That's the whole distribution. Like you have n, you know, qubits, pick uh, three of them like uniformly at random and pick, you know, random gate G from this set of uh, six matrices or whatever I had before and put it down. That's the whole circuit. That's your giant unitary. Um, okay. And uh, it kind of should even make sense, right? Like if you remember like not the, de-randomized squaring, just think about the squaring uh, or the powering of like the baby distribution. It's like the final version was like, you drew many times from this baby distribution and like multiplied the results together. That's literally like, you know, just like making a circuit where you just like randomly place like a bunch of little gates. So it's, it kind of makes sense. So we kind of really need to analyze now, like what are all the cape moments of like this giant unitary that you get when you just plunk down like one random gate. And uh, this, uh, by the way, we need this baby distribution to be like cheap to generate. And it's very cheap to generate. Like you just have to pick the position of the wire. So it's like log n cubed possibilities. Plus you need to pick like which gate it is. So it's, it's, it's very cheap to generate. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'll mention that. The question was like, you know, why do we pick uh, only from like this fixed set? If I understood the question, you know, maybe we should have just picked like a, a totally random, like three qubit unitary. That's, that's just like a constant size object. That should be fine. Um, we will eventually get to that. Um, I guess um, you have to be a little bit careful because like st strictly speaking, it's, although it's a constant size object, you know, you need to worry about like, what are the precision I need for all the entries so that like when I multiply them all together, um, I get like, you know, an epsilon accurate answer. And our epsilon is like very, very small actually. So you have to think a little bit carefully about like how many bits of precision you need to choose like all your entries. And um, we're eventually gonna sidestep that. So it's actually kind of nice that you have this discrete set because then like you might even worry like, oh, if I'm trying to choose like a, you know, pseudo random rotation matrices or unitary matrices, like I'm on a discrete computer, how do I output these matrices? Yeah, every column has to have the sum of squares equals one. We well, output them like literally in a completely exact and precise format as quantum circuits with like discrete gates. I mean, you just symbolically say like, this is the Hadamard gate and see if like symbolically represented the unitary. Okay. Good. So this theorem that you need is exactly what was done in this like, paper by Randau, Harrow, and uh, Michal Fordecki, and uh, had some quantitative improvements by um, Haberkamp and Hunter Jones. Uh, and it was even nicer, dependence on n was quasi-linear here. Um, 
But as I said before, interestingly, this is also literally exactly what like Gowers did with the permutations way back before. Like you can literally say like, just go back to this set of gates that we were using. Uh, like that's that's not a permutation matrix. That's not a permutation matrix. So these ones are. So just keep these three, and like multiply them together, like and make a random. Um, in this way, like make an n bit input, n bit output, like representation of a permutation matrix on n bit strings. And uh, yeah, what he showed was the analogous result that um, its case moments are like a little bit close to what they ought to be. And yeah, and the work with Pedro and Rocco, we did the same thing for rotation matrices. And there, like a similar, like just delete the phase gate, the one that puts the, the I into the picture. All, all the other ones are, are orthogonal gates. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we do this. Any, any questions? Yep. Do you need the n qubit dimension just to be convenient? Because I can have universal gate sets, right? Oh, yeah. Actually, this is actually a bit of an annoyance slash not exactly cheap, but um, we it's natural, like if you want to like sit around rotation matrices, like any dimension, like why does that have to be a power of two? It's kind of inconvenient when it's not a power of two. And we it's like inconvenient enough, like we did not pursue like trying to deal with it. Similar with the like Kaplan or Rheingold. If you look at their paper, they actually only give you pseudorandom permutations when capital N is like a power of two. Um, some of these works, like the unitaries, like do say, like, oh, we'll use like Q dits. So like maybe these are like um you know, like Q trits, and then you can get like powers of three. Um, yeah, it's a little bit annoying because it's very convenient to have this like framework of like, you know, tensor factors of Q dits or Q bits. Annoying enough that we didn't try to investigate that. So it's, it's kind of an open question, I suppose. Yeah. So if you unwind this uh, amplification you did, your basic, uh, your basic circuit will just be placing many of these random gates, right? Yeah, but in a pseudo random fashion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the depth would be linear. Uh, uh, the depth will depend on like what this uh, is. Um, so by basically, like if you don't, in some sense, forget the pseudo randomization for a bit. Like um, the depth will be uh, like log one over epsilon times one over delta. So. Uh, I have to think about it a little bit. Uh, maybe I got this a little bit wrong, but basically, like this, you know, the reciprocal of this, like, does control the depth of your random circuits. So you need n times poly k just to get the constant away from one. Yeah. And then it depends on what epsilon you need to get. That's right. So if you want, like, quite good, for example, um, unitary designs, uh, you need, well, at least what's known is like on the order of n squared gates. Because you need, like, you first, like, kind of need to, like, touch every single uh, wire. Plus, you need to do more to like make them good. So they're like, um, yeah, n squared gates at depth n. So that's kind of thing known for unitary. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you about how to do this, and you might actually might stop me and say like, you know, look, um, you know, these these quantum people already did it for like the unitary group. You wanted to, like our initial motivation was rotation matrices. You want to do it for the rotation matrices. They're like kind of similar groups, right? Like, isn't it kind of the same? And uh, yeah, I'm not gonna deny it. It's kind of similar. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Like, our proof gives like a unified analysis of both like the rotation matrices and the unitary matrices, and we make the parameters a little bit better. And I think it's like a little bit simpler and, and cleaner than how it was done in the previous paper. So that's what I can tell you about this subject. I won't deny this. Okay. Well, you know, I have like um, not that much time left. Uh, so I'll tell you about the outline of the proof, but this will be um, uh, very impressionistic because this is my PowerPoint skill. Uh, I only have a little bit of time. So um, yeah, we want to compare the baby distribution where you put a plunk down a random gate versus like, this is how I'll imagine the uniform distribution. Imagine you plunk down like an n qubit gate, which is itself like a uniformly random gate. That's a truly uniform unitary. Um, okay, and we want to show that this is like at least this much as random as this. That sounds like a vague English language sentence. I'm going to use this sentence a lot. Uh, it has a real meaning. 
which is that uh, when you average this distribution, this k-fold representation, and subtract that from the identity matrix to get a kind of Laplacian, like the associated matrix should be at least this factor in the PSD order times the thing with the uniform distribution. Well, never, never mind this math. I'll just use this phrase in the future. Um, OK, so step zero of the proof is exactly related to the question from over here. I mean, the first thing we do in the baby distribution is pick a random you know, three qubits, plunk down a gate from this discrete set. It might be like nicer to plunk down like a truly uniform uh, three qubit gate instead. And one can show that like this is at least constant factor, universal constant as random as uh, this, which is good. This follows from like a, like a powerful arithmetic combinatorics type theorem proved um, by Bourguin and Gambard in the context of the unitary group and by Benoist and de Saxe in the context of general compact simple Lie groups, uh, which rotation matrices are. So we'll just use that. And uh, that gets us from this picture to this picture. It, you should maybe think of it intuitively as not such a big deal. Like you feel like you could draw like three by three unitary pretty well. Which features of the bases do you need to use here? Pardon? Which features of your bases do you need to use here? Oh, excellent question. You need to use that it's uh, dense, which is like a universal. Also, amusingly, you need that the entries of the matrices are algebraic numbers, which luckily I and you know square root of a half are. That's fun. Okay. Uh, well, good. So now it remains to show that like picking three qubits and plunking down a random unitary is at least one over n as good as picking all the qubits and plunking down a random unitary. So it's going to be an inductive proof, inductive in terms of n. Um, and I told you step zero. So let's skip to the end. Let's skip to step n. In step n, uh, we're going to consider this distribution where you pick a random uh, wire, ignore it, and put down a random unitary on the remaining n minus one wires. This is pretty random. You're just like kind of not randomizing one qubit. And we want to compare this to the fully uniform distribution. And you might, hopefully, we'll get the intuition that these should be reasonably close. And indeed, like this number is going to be pretty close to one. Um, and the main, this is like the induction, doing this is like the induction step. So, like the main technical pages of the proof are like trying to prove a theorem. Uh, like this, comparing this distribution to this distribution. And uh, for every n, it's going to get bigger, better, like the, the bigger n is. And in fact, let's just denote by tau n, like the best thing we can eventually prove in the main technical part of the paper of this nature. Okay. So let's assume for a second that we've done that. And now I'll tell you the induction in a couple of slides. This is step n. Let's talk about step n minus one, which is about comparing this distribution, where like um, you pick two wires to omit and put a random unitary on the remaining wires, versus you pick one wire to omit and put a random unitary on uh, the remaining wires. And this is actually a claim. I claim that follow from the previous uh, slide, um, this is at least whatever tau n minus one is as random as this. And let me try to intuitively convince you of that claim. What's going on in this distribution? Like you pick a random wire to ignore, and a remaining n minus one wires, you plunk down a truly random unitary. And kind of on the last slide, we imagine we prove that like whenever you're plunking down a truly random unitary, it's almost as good to like plunk down like a random unitary, except you omit one wire. So like in this distribution where we're like omitting one wire at random and then plunking down an n minus one qubit unitary, let's replace the second half of that step of plunking down the n minus one wire unitary with uh, the, the weaker thing from the previous slide, where you like omit one further wire and plunk down an n minus two qubit unitary there. And that's just the same as this distribution, because like you randomly omitted two wires. So like inductively, like if you proved like a, you know, if you got this function tau of n, then like this compared to this is just tau of n minus one. Um, OK. You have to be a little careful to make sure that makes sense, but it does turn out to make sense. Um, and then you can put these things together and compare this like miss two case with like the miss nothing case. And the factor is like tau n minus one times tau n. You can check. And I hope the induction is kind of clear. You'll like, you know, omit like another wire and omit another wire. And you'll eventually get down to like omitting like n minus three wires. And you'll be in this position where you're comparing just pick three random wires and put down a random three qubit unitary gate on them. And I want to compare that to like put down like a random n qubit unitary gate. 
And the factor you get will be the product of all these like tau's. And these tau's are less than one, so it's getting smaller and smaller, and it's getting worse and worse. But like, hopefully, you know, as long as it doesn't go to zero or like it's still a little bit big, it's good. Right. So now I'll tell you about these tau's and like these two theorems. I'll just put them both up. Are like this is the main technical uh, part of the paper. So theorem one is that all these tau's are always at least 0.04. This is just some number that popped out of the calculations, but it's at least some universal constant. So like no matter what n and k are, in particular independent of k, these are all at least 0.04. So like okay, you could multiply together n copies of 0.04 and get exponential in little n. That's not great. But theorem two, it's like different techniques, we showed that like once you know you're at like a large enough n or m, let's say. You know, like you're you're randomizing almost everything, so you should feel like it's it's pretty good, um, as long as two to the m is bigger than k squared. It's not even that clear where k is anymore. Like what we're doing is like looking at the kth moments of these distributions. As long as um, m is big enough compared to k squared, and this is ultimately a bit like a birthday paradox thing. Uh, tau m is at least like one minus one over m, and uh, that means m is at least two log k. And now you can just do the math um, for the first log two log k many you know indices. Like you're forced to use this one 0.04, um, but that's okay. This gives you like a factor of one over poly k. And then for all the remaining ones, you can use this better bound, and you get like this and this telescopes. It's telescopes to um, I don't know, m minus one over n, which is at least one over n. So that's how you get one over poly k order n. So that's the outline of the proof. All the actual work in the proof is to prove these. Well, most of the work is to prove these two theorems. Hey, look, we're almost out of time. So like, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you about that. Anyway, you're probably tired. You're tired of the stupid baby. You got like the side eye about the coffee cup that's out there. So I'll just wrap it up. <laughs> um, yeah, final comments. I got like two more slides. Um, you know, these are the two theorems that we have to eventually prove. I'll tell you a teeny bit about what goes into them. Um, this one is uh, this one is independent of k. Kind of doesn't really mind so much what the distribution is. Um, this or, or what the representation is. Uh, this one's like a coupling argument. It's kind of nice. I mean, all these arguments we borrowed and modified from like Hafferkamp and, and um, Brandau at all. It's like a coupling argument that shows that if you draw like twice from this distribution, like you can couple a little bit. And uh, this one is like some linear algebra, and it, it really actually heavily relies on like knowing. What are all the kth moments? Like, what is this matrix you're eventually trying to match the expected value of the kth tensor power of a uniformly random unitary or rotation matrix or whatever? Um, so, a little bit of representation theory gets involved to know, like, what is this projection matrix that you're eventually trying to match? Um, so, just some final comments. You know, we tried to like do this in a unified setting where we cover the rotation matrices and unitary matrices at the same time. In fact, these are both like compactly grouped. So like, we were like, oh, let's try to do this in a general setting. You know, I kind of discovered, maybe I didn't know this before, but like, you think this is like a fancy definition that like, should have lots of instantiations, but there's basically only like three <laughs> compactly groups. Um, you know, here's some slides that like a top expert, Mark Mekis, like gave like a couple years ago about this setting. And he's like, listen, like our main characters are just these two groups, the orthogonal group and the unitary group. Actually, he called the special orthogonal group the kid sister of this group. Um, and as he said, they look a lot alike, but there are some subtle important differences, which I agree. We had to do like some different things. So eventually we had like, you know, a, a unified framework that, you know, at the end, like diverged a bit uh, between these two groups and how you prove these results. Um, it's funny, if you go on to read a little bit more from this, he's like, there's also this weird uncle no one talks about, the compact symplectic group. That's the other third. It's my picture of the weird uncle. <laughs> it's actually a painting of a bullfighter, and I think it is weird to be a bullfighter, so I don't mind putting up painting. Um, so just for it to be perverted, we decided to try to also do it for a complex infected group with like no real application. But we couldn't even get started because like somehow it's like not closed under like even tensorization. So this like plan of like having like a circuit, you know, symplectic qubit model didn't get off the ground. 
So I guess it's still an open question if you can figure out an application of it. Um, and just for one more upload question, you can also try to do the permutations, um, which is quite natural, via this plan. So this is not really how Gowers did it. Um, he did use like a path coupling argument, but it wasn't so much like this. And um, yeah, it was like a different argument. So you can try to do the um, permutations in the setting too, but we couldn't, we didn't try very hard, but we couldn't do it. Um, this particularly seems a bit unclear in this setting. Um, so it's kind of an open problem. I mean, if you want a, a problem to think about, um, for the baby distribution defined by like just one randomly placed classical reversible gate, um, sort of the best like spectral gap is not known. So like we got this, you know, basically one over linear and n in the unitarian rotation case. But um, the best thing that uh, I guess is known for Brodsky and Hurry has an n squared here. And it kind of means that if you want to make almost k-wise uniform permutations in this random circuit way, you need like n cubed gates rather than n squared gates. So this is like a fun kind of new, like maybe ish markup chain on permutations that um, perhaps you'll enjoy thinking about. And that's it. Uh, thanks. Any questions? Any questions for Ian? Yep. What about uh, pseudorandom uh, distributions of this uh, over the screw? What about pseudorandom pseudo distributions? Are, are those interesting objects as well? Like the uh, distribution with plus one, minus one. Sorry. Oh, pseudorandom pseudo distributions. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about it. And I can imagine there could be some applications. So it sounds like a good question, but I know nothing about it. I see. So I was thinking about like weighted PRGs. Right. It sounds like a good question. Question. So, uh, would, would your results imply uh, that let's say you take a bunch of uh, pseudo random autonomous matrices and you look at, say, like a polynomial in them? Uh -huh. uh, would the spectral norm match that of uh, if you took random uh, autonomous matrices? Basically, uh, are spectral norm polynomials as a test function something that this is pseudo random? Uh, I don't know, except insofar as you can try to use like the trace method. And this, this is the sort of thing you need for the trace method. That's all I can say. And to be honest, probably even know better. But uh, yeah, it's also, I mean, I think interesting to think about other uh, ways to try to measure like pseudo randomness. This is a pretty weak notion. Uh, but you know, the advantage is you can do it with very few random bits. So it's also a good question. Like, do you use this fact that like small subsets of like unitary matrices look like independent Gaussians? Like, wh where is this k squared? Come? Like, this two to the n bigger than k squared? Oh. That comes in the guts of the proof. Um, this matrix, this projection matrix, which is the average of this overall uh, uniform distribution of like the k-fold tensor power, is projection onto the span of all vectors which are fixed by all matrices of this type, like let's say unitary to or uh, rotation matrix to the k tensor power. And um, the nature of such, uh, the nature of those vectors are understood. It's like kind of the things that look like, uh, I don't know, like, um, like all, you put together like maximally entangled states according to like um, matchings. And as M gets like bigger and bigger and bigger, um, these um, fixed vectors, like the one eigenspace for this matrix, which is spanned by these fixed vectors, um, they have a natural description. They become like almost orthogonal. And so like, it's very hard to like literally understand the projection onto their span. But like, um, if you just like pretend that these like matrix or vectors that are the fixed vectors that the span is the whole space um, were, they're almost an orthogonal basis. And so like you can compete with them and analyze with them. And like uh, the bigger M is, the closer they are to being a truly orthogonal ba basis. And somehow that closeness is where K comes in. Yeah. Um, well, you can do whatever you want. So like, uh, like in our theorem, 
wherever it is, with like, uh, I don't know, k bits of, okay, wherever it was, with like the, the entropy was like k times n. k can be like literally anything. It can be constant, it can be log n, it can be like bigger than 2 to the n. Some previous works have like some, all these previous works usually assume that k is at most 2 to the n. But actually it's sensible to even have k bigger than 2 to the n and um, you can take it. So yeah, k can be whatever you want. Um, yeah, we'll just make the parameters. Work. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, we'll come back at eleven.